friends, welcome. It's Friday and that means it's time for Margaritas with Margarita Chang, CFP Pro. Today you are going to love our guest, Priya Danani. She is the Senior Program Officer on the Women's Empowerment and Gender Equity Team at the Asia Foundation. So Priya, that's just an amazing title and we are so excited to hear all about you and your work. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer of the show on the Incandescent Radio Network and IncandescentTV.com. And we are just so excited to talk about gender-based, well, not excited, but we're compelled to talk about gender-based violence, including human trafficking, violence against women and girls, and strengthening trauma-informed services for survivors. So today, Rita, you are in Chicago. Tell us a little bit about that before we get started, because that is directly connected to what we're about to talk about. Well, yes, I am in Chicago. It is the Chicago Marathon weekend. It's really not so much about running. Why am I running this marathon? Well, I ran it in 2019 and I was supposed to run it in 2020, but it was canceled because of the pandemic. And the purpose for my run is I'm a charity runner and I'm raising funds to support and empower girls through and women through the change that they realize from running. So that is why I'm here. I'm so excited to welcome Priya to our podcast to discuss the economic and financial abuse that she's witnessed and how we can all help women and girls to have more control over their lives and bodies. So thank you so much, Hope, for the intro. And Priya, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting to be you all and to have such an important discussion, particularly after the year that we've had, it's just, it's exacerbated a lot of the issues that we're talking about. So very timely. Well, thanks so much. I know that um, it's so important that people know the role that gender inequality plays in a cause for gender-based violence and the different types of violence. So if you don't mind, um, I know that hope read a little bit about you, but if you could share with our listeners and viewers the type of work you do and how you um, came into this work. Yeah, that's, I feel like I could take up all 15 minutes about how I got here, but I'll just start with saying that um, growing up in an Indian culture in the U.S., you know, just looking at the way I was raised um, to see gender norms, the way women were treated versus men, um, it really contributed to how I started to identify as a feminist and how I saw abuse overlooked in my community, my culture, and those surrounding me. And it really propelled me to start asking questions and push back to say, why are we, why is this okay? Um, and the older I got, the more I realized this isn't unique to a specific culture or a specific country. Um, and it's incredibly widespread. And that's why we say that gender inequality to violence um, or is a underlying cause of violence because many times we normalize it in our communities and in the way that we see it play out. And so the way I got into this work um, was actually, I found out that next to where I went to school in the suburbs of Atlanta, um, that I was living next to a brothel. Um, it was actually a cover up as a spa. Um, and it was, you know, in one of those little shopping centers of where I would go to school. And that blew my mind that that was so um, a part of my everyday and I didn't even know what I didn't even see it. And so I thought, whatever I do, people have to see it. People have to know about it and people have to be incredibly aware um, when we're talking about this shadow. And I think, Rita, you also asked me. A, a question about what I do now. Um, yes, sorry. yes, the role that you, <laughs> I, I, your per, I know that you have many roles. We have a volunteer role, so you can talk about your volunteer role as well as, you know, what you do uh, for your profession. Yes, yeah, so I, um, as Hope mentioned, I'm at the Asia Foundation, and I oversee and support our portfolio on gender-based violence, and so we work um, in 18 countries throughout Asia, uh, working on issues of governance, um, environmental resilience, um, and in a host of other things. But our underlying work is our empowerment and gender equality work. And I um, address gender-based violence 
uh, prevention and response, which also includes our work on trafficking. Um, and then Rita and I, how we got to know each other in a really special way was being on this board together of the Domestic Violence Resource Project, which is based in Germany. Um, and they focus on not only preventing violence against women and girls, but also um, in communities of, uh, of American, I'm sorry, Asian and Pacific Islander communities um, and focusing on uh, intersectional issues. Well, thank you for that. The other thing, uh, you're right, we could talk about this every week and I wish we didn't have to talk about it. When I first met Kritika, she said, you know, I love this work, but I really wish I didn't have to do this work. Um, so with that in mind, there are different types of abuse. You know, Hope and I have talked a lot about financial abuse um, and economic abuse. But if you wouldn't mind, can you just, because sometimes it's hard for people to understand that this is happening. What are some of the types of economic and financial violence that doesn't get talked enough? Yeah, absolutely. Well, because we tend to focus on domestic violence maybe widely or, or um, rape and sexual violence, which are incredibly important. But a lot of people don't know that 94% of domestic violence survivors have also experienced economic abuse. And that's a really high number. Um, and the types of abuse that we see is uh, maintaining control over financial resources, um, withholding access to money, um, attempting to prevent a victim or a survivor from working, attending school, um, just creating barriers for how they make money, or if they are going to work, um, you know, having them turn over all of their assets and finances and money um, to one person, usually that might be um, the husband or male partner. Um, and then having a, a victim and survivor choose between being in poverty or being homeless or turning over those, um, uh, turning over the money. So economic abuse is something that we see very much in every, um, when I was working with human trafficking survivors in a hundred percent of the cases that I worked on, um, we always saw economic abuse. And every time we, we provided services, they were all, all around psychosocial services, um, and, and health services, which are all important, but I thought how many times a contributing factor is the lack of access to finances or them having a job and a job not having a policy that supports domestic violence survivors. So they have to miss work and then get fired um, due to abuse. And so those are some of the, the very um, uh, many ways that I, that I get to see. One of the things that surprised me, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say surprised, but we are in a pandemic and the AAPI community has been hit really hard. Um, I did hear that some members of our community were having their stimulus checks withheld. What can you do about that? I mean, you can't call the government and stop payment, but you can't ask them to reissue another check. So how can we as viewers, listeners, supporters, advocates, um, help? Yeah, there were a number of organizations that worked with immigrant families that were asking for those that maybe received a check and didn't need it to donate their check to other families. Um, there were a lot of funds set up in that way for families that needed, um, you know, materials for school, for example. They were asking for very specific things. So I'm happy to share some of those organizations that are asking uh, for those funds. Um, the other thing that I would ask people to do is check what policies your organization has. You may not be a person who needs it, but there is somebody that you're working with that might be going through an abusive um, situation or you know, maybe too afraid to speak up to see if there's policies that would protect them if they needed to take a mental health day or to take off of work. Um, I know that a number of women a year lose their jobs um, because of domestic violence. And so that is a, a large way that we can help. No, that's really profound. You know, having those mental health days isn't just because you're stressed. For some people, it is adding additional stress 
loss of employment, income volatility, and so forth. So um, there's so much to talk about in this area. What um, if you, I know that you shared something very valuable. So even if people aren't experienced this, they might be decision makers, or they might be close to decision makers, some other like pearls of wisdom that we can do. Um, HR is like really important donating, but you know, sometimes people are scared. So what can we do to support the people who are experiencing it without, you know, violating confidentiality or prying? Yeah, that's a really important question, Rita. Um, my, the way that I usually go about it is to say safety planning. Um, there's an app that I can actually share. It's really easy. Um, it's called My Plan. Um, and I will, I'll send that link after, um, afterwards. But what I would encourage if you know somebody going through this is to ask them to create a safety plan. If they're ready to leave a relationship, then that is great. There's a number of organizations and services we could connect them to to help them take those steps so that it doesn't feel like they're doing it on their own. Um, but sometimes people are not ready to leave. And that is important. We have to, we have to wait till somebody is there. We can't push somebody to make that decision. Um, we can't make that decision for them. And so I would say to create a safety plan so that when you know there's heightened risk, um, for example, uh, sometimes I've heard um, those being abused say that, oh, when he comes home, he has a drink. And then that's when the violence escalates. It doesn't mean because it's caused by drinking. It's just exacerbated by it. But so what is a safety plan that we can put in place if you're the only one in the house, if there are children in the home? There are a number of um, safety planning measures that they could take. Um, is there somebody that they can call that comes out of school to pick them up or to drop them off? So th things of that sort is what I would suggest. Oh, Rita. Thank you for that. We always like to end on something positive. So we're definitely going to put everything in the speaker. Like, um, I know you have tremendous passion for what you do. What do you love most about the work you do? Oh, the people that I get to meet through this. I mean, when you talk about resilience, you know, if you were to look up the defin definition of resilience, you would see the incredible women and girls that are just if I could say it, badasses and really owning their, their experience and, and saying, you know what, this doesn't define who I am. It might be something that happened to me and turning that into something that propels them and makes them passionate um, to do what they want. And that's all, that's all I want to see young people do. So. I love it. And we are not going to let you go until you tell us, um, how we can find out more about your work and your organization. So websites, anything you want Absolutely. us to do. I'd be happy to. I was even thinking that um, the board that we're on, Rita, DBRP, um, I'm also happy to share their hotline number. Um, that way, if there are calls or even if you have questions, I actually have the hotline number in my phone and I might see something and I call and you know, just let them know that it's happening or connect the person. And, you know, that's something. So we can, we can all do something. Well, definitely. Thank you so much. This is such an important topic and it's the theme of our weekend. So now back to you, Hope. Thank you so much, Rita and Priya. That was, this is an amazing, amazing subject that we need to all come together and put an end to this abuse because these women are trapped. We need to help them as a group, as a community, as a as women everywhere. Um, and actually, what I'd love to do, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and it is the theme of the October issue of Incandescent Women magazine. So I would love to add this interview and all of your links. Um, the cover story is about Voices for Change and Respond Against Violence. We women who run those organizations are talking about the abortion law in Texas and really unpacking it. One's an attorney, one's a social worker, and the other is the founder, Tracy Shot of Voices for Change. So adding you all together, bringing you together because there's power in numbers, right? And we're gonna change this. We're creating a revolution, ladies. <laughs> so Rita, amazing, amazing work that you do. So happy, good luck this weekend. And before we leave, tell us about next week's guest, uh, Andrew Chenin, 
who is the co-founder and CEO, CEO of Procedure Holding. So what is very exciting is he's told me that this is actually, um, this is not Pride Month. June is Pride Month. October is LGBTQ History Month. So we're going to have a guest who's going to come on and discuss an ETF, an exchange-traded fund that invests in companies that have been screened by the LGBTQ community. So this is a form of um, sustainable, responsible investing. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to talking with Andrew. So many important topics about taking the guy that feels under, underserved and bringing it up. Women, the boys, the girls. So thank you, Priya. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will see you next Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern for 15 minutes of financial tips with Margarita Cheng, CFP Pro. I'm Hope Katz-Gibbs, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Stay well. Mm -hmm.